Hello, this is uh, Gary Brown from AIE Global. Today I'll be uh, talking about near infrared spectroscopy, continuing on from my uh, previous discussion. Uh, this is uh, part two. Uh, here's another, ex another example of the transmission of uh, light. Uh, these are a few different fibres, so they specially, they're specially made uh, fibres, uh, fibre optic cables, depending on the uh, uh, the wavelengths of, of interest that you're that you're using and the uh, distance you want to transfer it. So you need to be mindful of that also when you're designing your uh, inline application that uh, you just don't grab any old fibre off the shelf and uh, expect it to expect it to work. Probably the most common uh, spectrometer in use today would be the uh, dispersive spectrometer. Uh, why? Uh, predominantly it's uh, low cost so you could be $1,500 for um, up to $15,000. It has very fast uh, spectral acquisition time which is necessary in some, in some instances. Uh, we use, simple, use a silicon or ingas depending on the wavelength range. Silicon's okay as I mentioned before up to 1100 nanometers. Uh, whereas we use ingas when we work up from greater than 1100 up to 2.5 micrometers. External trigger is important for inline use, um, which is pretty much standard on most spectrometers these days. Uh, miniature models are available, so they they're not uh, large devices anymore. They quite can be quite small, and also handheld devices are available now. Uh, also important, specifically very important with in-gas devices, is the electronic cooling. So to reduce the, or to improve the signal to noise ratio, uh, most devices are cooled. So depending on your integration time uh, and the amount of light you've got, you could need to do a cooling, one stage cooling down to say minus 10 degrees, or two stage cooling down to say often minus 40 degrees. Um, there'll be a cost penalty incurred because of the uh, if you want to go to if you need to go to two stage cooling, the dispersive spectrometer is a fairly a very simple device. Uh, it's the light uh, from the product will come in on a Viac fire optic cable in the uh, the SMA connector uh, pointing pointing to by arrow one. Uh, the light from the fire optic cable will then shine onto a mirror at four, uh, onto a grating at five where it's broken up into its component wavelengths, and then onto another. Uh, concave mirror at six before it's then uh, focused onto the uh, sensor at eight. So the sensor at eight would be either silicon up to six hundred up to eleven hundred nanometers or an ingas up to two point five micrometers. Uh, the, the detector at eight is um, a multi is a um, device with uh, multiple elements. So depending on what resolution you want as to how many uh, pixels you need in that device, and once again that comes down to cost. So the higher resolution that you require, uh, the more more pixels that device will have. Typically, we normally use 800 to 1,000 uh, pixels is is what is quite often what's standard, or two, no 250 up to 1,000 say. Uh, there's another instrument which is a Fourier transform near infrared spectroscopy. Uh, what <coughs> why is this why is this used? Uh, it's it does have a quick spectrum acquisition, but nowhere near as quick as a, a grating device. Uh, but it, it does have the advantage of uh, higher to signal noise ratio. Uh, and it can be used through inline use via fire optic cables. So depending on what the uh, time you've got to acquire the spectra, and what resolution you need, um, and what signal to noise ratio you need, uh, then FT-NIR is probably a good option. As I mentioned, the last the last um, item talks about superior sensitivity, which is uh, which is very true. Uh, how does F FT and IR work? It's a compared to the um, previous spectrometer I showed you, it's a lot more complicated. Uh, it has a fixed mirror, and the uh, moving mirror is converts the the incoming light into wave wavelength based, uh, and as the mirror moves, then you sample the amount of light at the detector, uh, and that gives you a signal. You can see in the top top of that uh, picture there, FTNIR, as the Fourier analysis of your spectral signal. So once we we can uh, part, we can uh, apply a fast Fourier transform to that signal from the FTNIR spectrometer, 
uh, and we can get back to our original spectral, spectral data, spectral signal. Uh, so here's a comparison of a uh, Fourier analysis FT device compared against uh, compared to a dispersive device, and you can see the top the top curve is a. Uh, and what they've done here is they've just repeatedly taken samples against the same object, so it's a standard a standard uh, polystyrene um, reflecting the, the source light. Uh, so we're just constantly measuring the source light, and you can see the signal which is for the dispersive instrument. It's got a lot of um, it has a, has a certain a certain spectral signal, a, a certain spectral signature, which is not reflective at all of the of the standard. Because if you continually measure the same signal and measure the deviation from the from the uh, mean, then you should get a ideally in a per, real perfect world you should get a straight line, and that's certainly not the case with the dispersive instrument. But at the FTNIR is not so bad. It's uh, it's pretty good. So up the longer wavelengths, you're starting to get a little bit of uh, a signature there, but uh, generally considerably better than the dispersive instrument. Uh, the M MIR advantages MIR spectroscopy is, is used quite a bit in uh, on uh, benchtop units in laboratory, uh, where um, often the material has to be prepared. You can't use the material in its raw form. It often has to be uh, mixed or added to some other uh, component uh, because of its high absorbance uh, problems. But it does contain the fundamentals of vibration, so it's very easy to separate out uh, individual individual uh, materials or, or product. Um, whereas the its disadvantage is, it's uh, like I said before, the energy drops off rapidly with increasing wavelength. Uh, the you can't you can't transmit it easily through fiber optic cables. So the uh, that's reason one reason why it's limited to benchtop use is you you can't transmit the light or transmit the reflected signal or transmit signal back through fiber optics. Um, if you did try to do that, then the transmitting media becomes very expensive, uh, and the high absorption means the path lengths have to be very small. So uh, we can um, yeah typically typically um, uh, down less than fractions of a millimeter, and if you can't if you can't reduce the path length to significant to low, low, small enough uh, part or small enough level, then you sample preparation has to be required has to be mixed with something which is not absorbing. Uh, now the near infrared um, advantages are uh, uh, cheap transmission, so it's very easy to transmit the uh, light from from our product on the inline use to our to our uh, our instruments. The instruments themselves are, are cheaper to manufacture. Uh, the whole process of near infrared spectroscopy is non-destructive, uh, so you don't you can measure in line without uh, having to destroy any material, and they can measure continuously in line. Uh, whereas benchtop units require us to take samples, uh, we've we've got the down we've got the disadvantage of uh, uh, the time that takes, and then by the time you've done the test, then uh, normally it's too late. The the, uh, the process has gone on. It uh, can be also measured measured qualitative and quantitative. So we can, for qualitative analysis, for instance, we can determine if uh, a material is is changed in any way. So we don't necessarily say that uh, the protein level is equal to 10%. We're saying that uh, our process today, uh, our signature today or of our process is different than it was last week. Uh, so this can be used to determine only if something has changed in the process, and it can be used as a, an error or indicate to operators that they need to to look at look at their process because something is not uh, not kosher. Uh, or it can be used in a quantity for identification. So we can measure things like uh, the pro. It's been used for years for measuring the thing, the protein level of wheat, for instance, uh, or the fat level in uh, in um, sausages. Um, now, it's also for weak absorption. Um, in the NIR region, the, if, if for materials which do have a high concentration of, uh, of uh, water or moisture, then the weaker absorption in the NIR bands enables enables us to to look at the materials, uh, high moisture materials, which is certainly not possible at all with the, MI, uh, the mid IR region. And the low absorption means we can have longer path lengths, so we can work up to one to ten millimeters. Uh, 
And the signal-to-noise ratio is also important as well, that the uh, near-infrared has a high signal-to-noise ratio, which is uh, needed to get uh, reasonable results. And the last, the last point is the signal is not influenced by carbon, the carbon dioxide, which in uh, ex- ex- expensive near infrared uh, regions or instruments, uh, the CO2 has to be purged from the device. <coughs> Disadvantages of NIR, like everything, there's always disadvantages. Uh, <clears throat> there's less because we're working in the overtones and of the uh, uh, of the spectral data or the spectral signature. Uh, there's less information contained in the spectra, uh, and this takes uh, this to, to get this information from the spectra is is more difficult. Uh, but fortunately, a lot of uh, a huge uh, progress has been made in uh, chemometrics, in uh, principal component analysis, uh, and uh, PLS methods to extract that data from the from the near infrared signal. Uh, one of the big disadvantages is the last item I see is if we're not in in use in line use is the robustness of the calibrations. So we build uh, a model which we'll uh, discuss more in detail later on. Uh, <coughs> which will take samples from our process and use the uh, calibrated model to predict, uh, the, for instance, the uh, percentage of protein or the percentage of fat in our material uh, in f- of future products. But we need to make sure that that calibration is still robust, so it needs continually mon- continual monitoring. And generally, with near infrared spectroscopy, we can't measure components of less than one percent. So normally, we can measure fat, for instance, is uh, in in uh, cheese or butter or milk, is in the 10, 10 15, 20 percent range. Range. So that's that's okay. But one one difficulty we always had with uh, say trying to measure acid in fruit, uh, acid is typically less than two or three percent, and that was difficult to to measure. You could. Uh, you could take samples, you could build a calibration, but it was very hard to get a calibration that was robust over time. It would work this week and uh, next week it wouldn't work. So that's an example of what uh, we're talking about here. Uh, <coughs> so here's an example of near infrared uh, spectra uh, of a particular um, bacteria. And uh, we can look at the uh, we can look at the signal, and we, here we've identified the different overtones of the CH, uh, CH2, CH3. So the first overtone, the second overtone, the combination bands, and where they occur in the spectral data. Uh, and once again, it's the same similar thing. So here we've indicated the uh, where in the particular wavelengths the uh, NH stretching in proteins, for instance, occurs uh, in fatty acids, the CH stretching, and so forth. So we know particularly. Where, where to look in the spectral, the spectral data to see characteristics that we're looking for. So a system overview uh, we've put shown here to just give you an overview of, of uh, how the whole process might work for an inline application. So on the left we've uh, shown, if you can see the product line, so S, the spectrometer, is uh, measuring the, the light which is transferred or transmitted through the material. So we've got the light source from the from the spectrometer going through the sample and back to the spectrometer. The spectrometer is hooked up to connected to a PC, often through a fiber optic, uh, often through a USB cable or an Ethernet network. Uh, and then the PC will uh, uh, control the spectrometer and continually read sample data. Now, depending on the spectrometer, uh, there can be anything anything from say 20 milliseconds per sample up to one second. For inline use you don't really need to be going any longer than one second. <clears throat> and it depends on what the product sample is, whether it's a continuous sample or whether it would say uh, uh, a binary type sample which has to be synchronized to the process. Uh, from the PC we calculate through Beer's law the absorbance. So here you see a graph of the absorbance spectra that we've, uh, we've collected. And from, from the absorbance spectra, we uh, apply the wavelengths of interest between X1 and Xn uh, to a regression equation, which we've determined from our calibration model. Now, R is the result, and it, it, the, res- the result we've determined is equal to the, uh, the B0, B1 up to Bn is the uh, coefficients. Uh, 
each coefficient is multiplied by its wavelength of, uh, that we've selected for the for the calibration model. Uh, now that will that will uh, will be the result. It could be protein in wheat, uh, for instance. It could be the sugar level in the total soluble solids in uh, orange juice, for instance. Now we've got to validate that result. So on the right hand side, you can see a bit of a graph there, which is the validation um, validation sample or validation spectra, validation graph. Um, on the from the horizontal axis, we've got the actual result plotted against the predicted result, which is R. Now, if if our, our calibration is working, ideally, in a, it would be all laying on all samples would lay on a, a single line uh, at 45 degrees. Now, if that was the case, then the coefficient of determination R squared would be equal to one. As the samples deviate from that line and scatter around the perfect line, then R squared will drop to be less than one. Uh, typically, we try and try and keep R squared 0.9 and above is very good. Uh, 0.9 and 0.8 to 0.9 is acceptable. Uh, less than 0.8 is starting to be a little bit more, di little bit difficult. Uh, also, we calculate the uh, RMSECV, which is the root mean square of the uh, error and cross validation, uh, and that just that indicates the um, the error we're getting between the also an indication of the error between the actual value and the predicted value. So, how do we build a model? Well, uh, towards the after the the bottom half of the picture there, we see uh, that we've taken samples off the line. So we've measured the spectral data or the spectral uh, signal or signature using our spectrometer and our PC. Now to build a calibration model, we've got to then take the sample which was we have the spectral signature, signature from and measure what the component is that we're trying or the constituent is that we're trying to measure. So for protein, we'd have to measure the actual protein of the wheat. Uh, for orange juice, we would take a small sample of juice that we had the spectra for and work out the, uh, the BRICS level for it. Now, once we've determined the uh, actual values, then we put them into a... Uh, match them up against the spectral signal and we put, them into a, put that data into a statistical analysis package uh, and that will we'll then use the PLS method typically to then build a... Uh, regression co re regression equation, which is at the top of the page, which can be used in future prediction. Uh, now, the method, the the science of uh, uh, applying the uh, measured values against the spectra and uh, generating a regression model uh, is called a chem it's called chemometrics, and it's been it's been around for quite a number of years, and it's. Uh, it's really chemometrics, which is which has enabled the extraction of the of um, data from the spectral signature of the of the product, and that's what really it's what really what chemometrics is is the practice of applying mathematical tools, to, which is typically statistical analysis, uh, in order to extract chemical or physical information from the data set. Uh, so. The f it enables, you can break it down to a number of steps. The first steps are data pre-processing, which is uh, baseline removal, uh, typically the sec first and second derivative, uh, filtering and scatter correction. Uh, then we need to, because we've got our data coming in, we have a huge number of variables, each variable being a wavelength that we've selected. We may have 250 uh, of up to greater than 500 wavelengths. Uh, for this is not, we, you can't process that, there's too many variables. So what we've got to be able to do is reduce the number of variables. And we do that via uh, principal component analysis. So for instance, for, for our fruit, uh, measuring the, um, the total soluble solids for orange juice, for instance, uh, you would use typically a couple hundred uh, wavelengths. And through principal component analysis, you can reduce that down to uh, half a dozen uh, wavelengths. Uh, and those half a dozen wavelengths, what they principally do is to, uh, instead of the the first axis of a principal component analysis will uh, indicate the greatest amount of variation within the data set, the second axis will, will be the second set, or the second amount of variation in the data set and so forth. So it realigns the axes or the components to indicate the variation in the data set. Whereas our original, our original axes of uh, wavelengths, we had no idea which wavelengths which were important and which weren't. So the whole principle of um, PLP, principal component analysis or uh, PLS calibrations, is to first 
uh, organise the data into so that the first axis so it gives us the the, uh, the largest amount of variation in the data set. Uh, and part of the process of doing that is that we also detect uh, outlier detection. Uh, sometimes you just get bad samples uh, which can be removed. Uh, and also the uh, analysis also allows us to do either qualitative or quantitative analysis which I've mentioned to you previously. Uh, now what, the whole, uh, what we talk about here is uh, model development. Uh, unfortunately it's not the models which I've shown here, it's, it's total, totally mathematical uh, analysis uh, and it relies heavily on statistical analysis which is, uh, if you go into the mathematics behind it, it's extremely complicated and not necessary for us to, to be able to use the technology to be able to get reasonable results. The, the statistical analysis packages which we buy off the shelf uh, do all that hard work for us. But you still need to know a little bit about what's going on to, to appreciate the, uh, the results. Uh, so in model development, I mentioned previously, we have two, two modes of model development. We have unsupervised mode, uh, which we don't try and predict against a particular result. So we're not measuring, we, don't, we take away the measurement part of the process and we just uh, map um, spectral signatures into like clusters in, a multi, in the principal component space. Uh, and uh, and then in prediction of the in prediction mode, we will then map the the uh, the new data into into the same into the same space, and we can see then whether we are mapping onto an original cluster or we're now mapping as an outlier. We're mapping into a different type, different uh, different space. Uh, 